So today we'll be studying looking at uh, videos. Um, so um, just look from a, in this lecture, we're just mainly going to look at the, the, the technical aspect of video and how it differs from images. And um, I'm going to dive into uh, motion estimation. Right, so, uh, so a few points to, you know, all this is uh, you know, about like uh, 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 200 years old. So this, uh, this is the first picture that we, uh, we have, the surviving pictures of the earliest uh, photograph uh, uh, from uh, 1826. And so the, uh, <coughs> so shortly after the discovery of uh, photography, you know, people were starting to use that for um, recording films. And of course, you know, that came with issues. Um, so the, the first instance of trying to do something like that, actually um, trying to use um, uh, moving images, um, that's from uh, 50 years after, okay? So it's quite a big gap. And it also there was a bet, so the, the question so, uh, was, uh, does a horse have all four hooves of the ground at any stage of its trot, okay? And of course, it's too fast for human eye to see what's going on, so people were wondering, you know, what's going on? Uh, can, we, can, we, can we say that? And so this guy, Newbridge, uh, uh, took on the bet, and so, what installed is um, a system where he had uh, a number of threads. So he had a stage and the horse going through the stage uh, trotting and um, he had a, a number of uh, pieces of strings or threads uh, going across the, the, the track. And every time the horse will uh, cut a thread that will uh, trigger uh, a pinhole camera and that will just take a steel image from that particular instance, okay? So what you see here is different um, cameras being put in a sequence and uh, each of them has been triggered as the horse was passing in the alignment of that, uh, of that camera. Um, and then, you know, when you play that back, then you can see at any given time uh, whether uh, the, uh, the four hooves were indeed of the ground and the question is yes, of course, uh, uh, if you just look at, uh, one of these, no, it doesn't work. Um, if you look at this one, um, then four hooves are off, okay? So even so technically it's not um, uh, a film, uh, it very much looks like uh, so because you have, uh, you know, if you play back all these pictures, um, then you actually you have uh, moving images. Interestingly enough, this idea uh, was then reinvented, if you want, um, in the 90s um, with a um, guy from, I forgot his name actually, the guy uh, from the BBC uh, who decided to do uh, things with uh, cameras and he had uh, a ring of, uh, of, of these uh, cameras, pinhole cameras on a circle and uh, he would start to record things and try to play back the, the pictures and so on. And that caught the attention of people uh, from the movie industry and particularly guys from the Matrix. And if you remember the Matrix, have you seen the Matrix? Right, so remember the, the slow motion effects you know you have? Uh, that was the, the, the iconic shot from the Matrix. Um, so that was actually a whole bunch of cameras that were put side by side and using the same idea. So you didn't have threads, this time you just have, uh, they were gen locks, so they were electronic, electronic, electronic electronically synchronized um, cameras. And each of the camera will record a different view and then if you play back from one camera to the other, um, uh, then, um, then you get the matrix effect. Interestingly, uh, and this is you know, something that relates to Trinity and this department in particular, um, what they were missing, they couldn't put enough cameras side by side to get enough frames, to have you know, enough in between frames. Uh, so what they had to do is to find a way of interpolating between cameras, okay? So you have two cameras and you have to play back, you know, every single frame from, uh, from these cameras um, in, in a motion. And I was going too fast. Uh, and you can see here, right? So, uh, you know, if these are consecutive frames, uh, obviously 
uh, there is a lot of, you know, the time gap is too, too far apart, okay? Um, so what they wanted to do finally is a way of digitally, um, you know, finding the in-between uh, frames and to be able to play, play back with a, in a smooth way. Um, and as it turned out, they contacted, so people working on that were uh, in a company called Snell and & Wilcox. And um, this guy then uh, was in contact uh, with Anil Kokaram from the department here who wrote the algorithm to do that and then in the metrics two and three uh, they basically used this uh, algorithm and Anil got uh, a committee award for, for that work. So anyway, so that's the first instance of uh, moving images, uh, but we wouldn't call that cinema. Uh, the first instance of cinema is from the Lumiere brothers. Uh, they basically used the um, Celluloid film invented by Edison, um, and they looked at that and said, "Well, that's interesting." And uh, so they 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 used that technique called a machine called kin kinetoscope, and they started to record ten short movies. Um, and they had a premiere in Paris in nineteen uh, in eighteen ninety five, and that's kind of the the birth of cinema um, uh, uh, as you see it. So. From what we've seen, okay, so the obvious point, okay, so the a picture, well, at least a photograph, is definitely continuous um, in, in in space, um, but it's not in time, okay. So you really have, um, you know, the number of frames. Like if you have 24 frames per second, well, that's you know a discretized uh, sample version of your of your time, and that causes all sorts of issues, um, and that's why motion estimation would be a quite an important aspect. Is like how do you get uh, to know where objects have moved in time from frame to frame. So TV uh, is actually not that old. I mean, already in the late uh, 1900, uh, you had technology for that. This is the uh, Nibco disc. Um, so basically. Uh, I mean, it could be anything, like okay? it could be plastic or whatever, and, but you have holes here and they're, they're equally spaced. And so basically, uh, when you spin that wheel, you'll capture um, the, the light only at a particular pixel location, all right? So you, you have a recording device behind that you know, um, transfer the, uh, the light into some kind of uh, electric signal. And basically you have this rotating um, disc and at every single instant in time, you only see a particular point in the, in the frame. And if that uh, moves fast enough and it's big enough and has you know, enough holes, then basically what you get at the end of that is a signal a stream of uh, pixels coming, you know, scanning the, the frame from top left to bottom right. Um, so the first, so you would be able to see that using a CRT uh, TV and then basically, uh, the Scottish man, uh, John Logie Bird, uh, was the first one that you know, saw how you could transmit all that, and he had a, a whole system uh, in place to demonstrate that. Um, so the first broadcast in high definition okay, uh, was in uh, 1936, so just before the war. Uh, but you see, things were moving quite fast because just right after the war, um, so 53, you already had 3 million viewers for the coronation of the queen. Um, so that's really quite popular. And color came uh, uh, shortly after that in the US and took a bit of time for it to reach um, the uh, uh, Europe. You can see here there's two names, okay? So the US have different standards from uh, Europe. So US is called NTSC. Uh, and um, the uh, Europe, uh, well, really I should say UK is PAL. Um, so it had different systems in France would be SECAM and all sorts of different systems there. Um, but that's kind of, there's a zoo of different format there, right? So unfortunately, okay, we had TV before we had ways of recording TV, right? Which is a bit a sad story. Uh, so usually people, what we do, it was just, um, do a uh, uh, concept called, I think, telecine. So you would um, basically put a film camera, so you have your CRT screen displaying the TV, and you had a film camera 
just pointing at the screen and just recording that and then uh, it was not very good okay um, but that's that's what we had um, so when you look at the the first systems to record tv they're actually a bit later so 1950s um, they were recording uh, the actual signals uh, using uh, tapes made of steel uh, so as you can imagine uh, if and they had problems of bursting uh, so as you can imagine you don't want to be in the set the, the operator or the machinist working on that because having pieces of steel flying around is probably not very nice um, the the, rec the recording tapes as probably you've already seen um, uh, dates back from the 70s to 80s uh, so this is the VHS um, standard probably you've heard of the Betamax versus VHS have you heard that it's a classic uh, classic story with different versions and different angles to it uh, but basically you had uh, two different standards uh, and they're one by Sony and one by Panasonic and some people will claim that the Betamax was better quality. Uh, some people say and that some, somehow VHS came first and therefore was better. And, I don't know. Anyway, the point is uh, VHS won that war. And uh, so it's classic business case to be. And uh, so in, in 1980s, that they basically won and everybody uses VHS at home to record TV. This is only analog, okay? So at this point, we're only uh, looking at the signal. It's analog, analog signal, there's no digital stuff. Uh, it's only quite late, so we look at the um, 90s, but we start to have tapes that record digitally the signal. Um, now, you would never have seen that. We have a few in our lab. Um, interestingly enough, these are still being used uh, by uh, visual um, media productions. Uh, so if you go to uh, uh, people making documentaries or making even animations and so on, sometimes what they do, they, they record, um, they don't necessarily send a DVD, right? They would just um, take record their, their film or their documentary on these tapes and then they will give that these tapes to uh, other people. So that's still a way of communicating, of sending, um, of sending uh, videos, right? Uh, but this is, this is dying out, obviously. I mean, this is, this is not the future. Um, and of uh, the 90s, you have DVD and, and, and uh, digital TV uh, coming. And uh, so more recently, uh, things started to move to uh, HD, so uh, higher resolution, and Blu-ray, and now we have 4K TV and so on. All right? So, Looking back at analog signals, uh, so how, how did they go about? Uh, so this is on top, this is, um, this is PAL signal. So I said like there's different standards for how it was recorded. This is for the PAL. Uh, so on the left you have, um, if you want your, your image for a, a signal frame of your video. And this is a typical scan line. So you would, you would scan this, um, this, uh, this frame from left to right and you know top to bottom and then you start each line by some kind of a synchronization pulse um, so very short one to, to tell you that's the start of the line and then you send a signal so up and down so it tells you you know uh, it's grayscale obviously okay we're talking early edges okay uh, so high means bright and you know zero means dark and then you finish that and you give you you know, you have you wait for the next um, sync line uh, sync uh, signal to get the uh, the start of the new line. Okay, so it's quite straightforward. Um, but then, of course, came along color, and you're like, right? So with broadcasting, uh, lots of people bought you know TV sets um, that can get uh, black and white. Uh, so you need to find a way of sending a signal in color. Uh, using the same antennas and so on, um, but you don't want the people that had black and white TV to not get the signal anymore, so it has to be um, backward compatible. And so, uh, well, forward, but anyway, compatible. Right? 
Um, so the, that's where the NTSC and the PAL uh, kind of differ, uh, but basically they all work with uh, um, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, the CAMs, CAMs, I think, correctly um, amplitude modulated signals. So um, basically, you say your signal is the so Y, so that's your the Y channel. Okay, so remember you're working YUV, and um, and then. Uh, you have the U and V, but you use the Y as your your um, your, your you know your main frequency, um, but that's modulated um, by a higher frequency, and um, and where you you have um, two parts, so you have the U and the V, the chrominance, I kind of um, go at a higher frequency on top of that signal. Okay, so if you're if you're watching on your old TV. Um, because you're looking at a lower frequency, uh, you won't see the U and the V, and if you had a new TV set, you'll be able to uh, isolate these parts and demodulate and get, um, get the color, all right? So that's kind of pretty much it for uh, analog TV. Um, this is something that actually has still an impact, okay? Um, have you heard of interlaced? Images, no, not something you're familiar with. Okay, um, so you think naively that all um, that you, you know, how do you scan a picture? So remember the, the spinning disk, okay, that we don't have anymore. But with still the CRT and everything, it's like you, you have your signal is a, a sequential signal. Okay, so you 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 have to store the image uh, in one D order. Okay. And so the, the way you scan the picture uh, matters, okay? So there's two types of scanning. There's the progressive scanning, which is probably the way you thought about it, okay? So you start from the top uh, left and then, um, and then you go down, okay? So you scan along the, each rows and you go down and then when you're finished here, you start again from the top, okay? And so it means like every single pixel is nicely aligned uh, the way we've seen uh, mostly described, okay? The problem with that is um, the, the, the visual effect you get um, is, okay, you have a problem with the speed at which you go, okay, and the refresh rate you get. So scanning your picture takes time, all right? So by the time you reach here, it kind of goes in a continuous way and it goes at, say, 25 frames per second. So you, 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 you go from here to here, uh, which means that this, um, you have a gap, you have quite a, a, a gap in between the, the pictures, okay? Uh, so first you have a delay between here and here, and then you have a gap uh, between the pictures, and that means that um, when you, say, watch sport or watch anything with fast motion, um, you, uh, the, the motion doesn't look right, okay? It looks kind of uh, um, jittered or, you know, it, it doesn't look smooth, okay? And so basically the refresh rate was not fast enough, all right? You have kind of this effect if you not, uh, if you look carefully in movies, theaters, um, when you have very large object moving very fast across uh, the screen, sometimes it looks a bit uncomfortable, like you can see um, um, kind of stop motion, all right? It doesn't, doesn't go smoothly. And that is because in cinemas you go at 24 frames per second, which is not very high. Um, so, the, the way they've, they sort to solve this problem, okay, so like the sampling rate in time is not fast enough, right? So they say, well, let's increase the frame rate artificially by using an uh, interlace uh, system. And this is kind of how it looks like. So you do this hybrid thing where you, um, you display at any given time you only display, um, you double the frame rate, okay? So you, instead of saying 25 frames per second, you, know, you go really 50 frames per second. But what you do then is to lose half the resolution in, in heights, okay? Um, so, all right, let, let's, go, let's see how it looks, how it goes, okay? So you have, okay, so let's, let's look at the scan line here. No, that's not going to help you actually. Um, Right. <laughs> the idea is like you, you have a number of rows, okay? So um, 
you have even and odd rows, okay? And the even rows are going to capture the picture at time t, okay, of frame t. And then the um, odd rows, that should have been odd here, um, uh, will capture the frame, uh, uh, the next frame, okay? And so you kind of, you know, it looks squashed, and that's because, you know, we compressed them, so the, the, the vertical resolution is halved, okay? Uh, so that's, that's what's going on here, and then you recompose that by um, having this interlaced frame where, um, you know, you recombine. So here, all the uh, even rows um, correspond to this image, and all the um, odd rows correspond to this image. All right. So here this looks blurred and kind of, you know, you have the two pictures superimposed. And that's because actually um, you have uh, every single row is, comes from a different picture. All right. And you can see the motion going on here. There's a bit of this motion. There's, uh, you know, the next frame overlaid with the current frame. Okay. So you can see here uh, half of the, uh, the hat and the, the half of the hat. That corresponds to because the hat has moved between the two frames, right? And you would think, okay, um, this has somehow died out, okay? I'm surely by now people, you know, this doesn't look right. Um, and there's all sorts of problems with that. Uh, one of the problems, of course, is that you never record, uh, at, at no given time do you have um, a clean image, okay? Or what you get at a, a, a given time is either half of the resolution on one picture or half of the other picture. But if you want to see what's going on for a pixel, how it moves in time, it's, it's a mess because you never have uh, a still image of the full resolution at any given time. All right? And so it's, it's, quite, it's very tricky to recompose, to go from interlaced to uh, progressive because you really need to, do, to know exactly how the motion went and to, you have to reinvent part of the pictures you don't have and so on. Um, so you think that has died out, um, but when you look at the statistics of uh, YouTube um, videos that are, you know, videos that are ingested by YouTube, uh, it's still like, I think 5% of videos or 10% of the videos uh, are still interlaced, okay? And that is because um, what you get from that, okay, is a higher frame rate. So um, it is, you know, however you look at it, you get a higher frame rate and frame rate if you're looking at action or if you're looking at broadcast, um, that's what they use, okay? So you want higher frame rate, you want 100 frames per second, or you want whatever. And so interlaced is a kind of cheap way of getting that. So it's a, the compromise you get is um, you lose a bit at the picture quality at any given time, or you lose a bit of information, um, but you get more frames per second. Uh, and that's not going to die, that's probably going to be here for the rest of mankind. Uh, probably going to still have interlaced images. Um, that means that when you do video processing, uh, if you end up having uh, uh, interlaced images, uh, you'll be in pain, okay? You won't be happy, right? So you'll be like, oh no, it's interlaced. It's not, it's not great. Right, so, um, sorry about the slides. It's, yeah, it's a bit of a mess. Um, this one worse. Doesn't work. Okay. So some differences between uh, NTSC and PAL. So NTSC, the American system. So they use slightly different cross spaces. Um, these are the, the slight version um, between both. Uh, this is the, remember the YUV is just a, a, a rotation of the RGB color space. And um, the and, uh, NTSC, they use something called YIQ. Um, it's basically the same. I mean, if you look at the first component, which is still the Y component, um, it's the same equations here. Um, but then it's just the, the colors are kind of uh, orthogonal, okay? They're just like a, a right angle of each other. Uh, it doesn't change anything, it's really much, um, uh, it's a bit arbitrary what U and V should be or, or R, Q, um, uh, it just turned out to be different. Uh, the number of lines is fairly similar. Uh, the frame rate is different and that makes a big difference. Um, that means that the, so PAL uses definitely the interlaced system I talked about, NTSC use a different system of interlacing. 
uh, <coughs> goes three to, point, three to pull down. Um, so <coughs> anyway, so you end up with something which runs at 50 frames per second or 50 hertz uh, for PAD and 60 hertz for NTSC. Uh, these are you know, minor differences, um, but they, they're, they're here. Right, so coming along, um, digital capture and who has heard of CCD um, sensors? Have you heard of CMOS sensor? Yeah, all right. So a few years back, um, the, the main system for uh, recording uh, uh, um, images, capturing images uh, digitally, uh, so using these, um, these chips was the CCD array. And the idea was like you have a passive set of uh, uh, sensors here, and then um, you would, um, so you have a, a, an exposure time where you accumulate the charge of each of these sensors. You had a, a capacitor um, linked to each of these guys. And then um, you would have a clever system where you would be able to transfer uh, line by line. So you transfer the, the charge from this guy to this guy to this guy. So you kind of push down all uh, from, from pixel to pixel and then you will do the readout at the end, okay? So you have um, accumulated charge and then you have this um, register shift operation coming on that will be able to uh, transfer this, um, all this picture into some, uh, s s some registers and then from the registers, the, the signals will be amplified and converted to video signal, okay? Um, I have, I think, How does it work? No. Ah, 